to the next session now, which is a special session on MNRE's perspective. I would like to welcome Dr. Prasad Shafikar, Deputy Sec Secretary at MNRE uh, for the next session. He is an IRS officer, has worked for eight years in the field in Mumbai in various departments such as Assessment, Investigation, Wing and Headquarters. He's currently involved in the Green Hydrogen Mission at the Ministry. He's an electrical and telecom engineer by training from VIIT Pune and has a master's degree in laser technology from IIT Kanpur. He also has a PhD in electrical engineering from IIT Bombay. Mr. Shafikar, I would like to. Uh, first of all, uh, many thanks to Renewable Watch for in inviting me here. I would just uh, start with a note of um, caution. We all know that the code of conduct is in place for elections, and there are limitations to what we can say in public. So uh, I would not be able to comment on new policies or, or, or any initiatives, which um, you may see uh, in the sometime. It's not proper for me to comment on that. I can only comment on what have been done so far. So I'm uh, sort of limiting myself to what is already approved and in the public domain. And I also will not be able to answer uh, very specific questions about uh, upcoming policies because of uh, the mandate uh, of, the, of, of, of the Code of Conduct. With that, there is still much left to say. I'll just give a brief update on the mission. Uh, most of you are aware, but uh, for those who are not, I'll just do a quick update. The mission was launched uh, on 4th January last year. Uh, within a year, almost just a few days from that, few few days more than one year, we announced, we um, published the guidelines, we gave the, uh, we had the tenders, and we also awarded them within almost one year. Uh, we have awarded uh, capacity incentives for 412,000 tons per annum of hydrogen and 1.5 gigawatt per annum capacity for electrolyzers. Uh, we have released the R&D roadmap, the R&D scheme, and the cost of proposals for R&D is also out in the public domain. So anyone who is interested in the tech development can always participate. I believe there are a few more days left uh, uh, to, to, to submit any projects for R&D funding. We also have floated the tenders for the second tranche of electrolyzers. Uh, 1.5 gigawatt already done, 1.5 gigawatt is more in line. And we did some innovation because last time we felt that uh, smaller players did not get enough space to participate. So this time we have made a special bucket for smaller players who are not setting up uh, these gigafactories, but they're, they're, they are innovating on their own and maybe a few megawatts or 10 or 15 or 20, that's the scale which they're looking at initially. So with a view to support them as well, we have kept a separate bucket for them. And of course, we have buckets for the usual, the big uh, big players. Uh, this is a site program. Uh, we, have, we have notified uh, guidelines for domestic use in fertilizers and refineries. And the scheme guideline is out. And obviously, we, the next step is to do the tendering, which uh, will be taken up only once the code of conduct is uh, lifted. Um, this is about the site program, which is the biggest component of the mission. Uh, I mean, out of the around $2.4 billion of the scheme budget, $2.1 billion is for the site program. So site program is progressing quite, quite rapidly. And we have given a three-year timeline in the tenders to commission these plants. So which means by um, January, February of, of, uh, of 2027, we would see at least this much capacity coming up. So that's 400,000 tons of hydrogen, which is roughly around uh, 2 million tons of ammonia, at least, which is being incentivized. Of course, there are projects which are coming out with, without our incentives. I mean, there are, currently there are very small scale ones, but they are going to increase uh, as, as the time comes and we have more export agreements. Same with other countries as well. Um, the pilot projects is a very important part of the mission. Uh, we have notified the guidelines for all of them by the pilot projects 
in March itself, uh, uh, sorry, in the month of uh, uh, February. And uh, even, I mean, the bids were also submitted for the pilot projects in transport. So uh, there, ARAI is the agency which is, which is implementing this, uh, this, this scheme. And they've already floated the proposals, they've already finished. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the last date is also gone. So I believe uh, they will take some time to evaluate the proposals and again, once the code of conduct ends, sometime after that, we will be able to announce the winners of the first pilot's projects. Um, so these roughly are the big components of the mission which uh, we will be taking forward. The mission document is, is very, very clear as to what we plan to achieve and what specific tasks are laid out for every ministry in that. We have notified guidelines for skill development. All the, all the guidelines which we, we have notified till 16th of March, you will see them being put in place. The actual implementation will start shortly after the elections are over. In addition to that, um, <clears throat> this is the mission part. They, we also do a lot of uh, supporting activities for the mission. Uh, uh, last year we had a international conference on uh, uh, green hydrogen in July last year. We hope to have one edition uh, this year, the second edition. The timing is yet to be finalized, but we'll announce it uh, shortly once uh, we, we get the approval. Uh, we are also negotiating with many countries on Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement and we believe that will facilitate investments and offtake demand coming from those countries, from Indian companies. Again, the, we have sent the agreements to them long back and we are, in some countries we are in, we are in advanced talks, some countries we are following up and each and uh, as and when we strike uh, the perfect balance which is win-win for both countries, you will see those, those agreements being, being signed as well. Uh, a, a, a major part left from uh, uh, currently is the standard. We have, we, have, the, we have set the limit for 2 kg, but the specific scheme for that, how to measure, who will measure, that part is still left. We are working on it. And uh, you will, again, uh, we are talking to the industry and we will again hope to see a major movement on that once uh, the code of conduct is, uh, is lifted. Uh, Mr. Prasant gave a, he used the word, uh, a conservative estimate. I, I think it was ultra conservative, I would say. Uh, various studies have been done and based upon our industry feedback, of course the, 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 the announcements which we have tracked till around Jan were around 7.4 million tons. Of course, it's a challenge to uh, get from announcements to actually on-ground implementation, but I'm saying 1 million ton is a, a very conservative, I would say. We will be much, much higher than that. Um, I do not want to, as I said, because of the conduct, I don't want to comment much on what we will be doing, apart from the ones which I already mentioned. Uh, I would not take much time. I would rather be interested in knowing what the industry expects of us so we can, uh, any queries is the industry and other stakeholders have, so that we can uh, focus on delivering those objectives uh, shortly once we have, the elections are done and then we have a stable mandate to carry on the mission. So I would like to pause here a bit and I would like to uh, invite questions as it is uh, better to answer your questions rather than, uh, I mean, we can go on and on talking about what we will do. But as long as, uh, I mean, it, it, so it should be in sync what, what you think are the priorities. So I would encourage you to ask as many questions as I can. As I said, I may have some limitations in saying what we can do until the code of conduct is in place. So I may not be able to give you any assurances, but uh, rest assured that if I can't give any assurance, it means uh, that we will be taking that query home to the ministry and we'll be working on that till we have the, the time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chafikar. Two, three questions from my side before I move to the audience questions. 
Uh, there was a question in the last session about the export potential of India. Where do you think India stands in terms of you know, its export potential when you compare it with markets like Oman or Saudi Arabia or even the US? So I presume you're talking about green hydrogen, not blue hydrogen. Yeah, just the green hydrogen, yeah. So um, often the discussion on cost of hydrogen only focuses on the cost of renewable energy. That's a very important component. But here we have an implicit assumption that we will be able to uh, deliver that energy from production to use. That assumption is not always true in all countries. Like in India, you, with open access, you can set up projects anywhere in India and have a plant anywhere, anywhere else in India. But that is not the case in many countries. Mm. Uh, even Australia, Bureau, mm. Oman, they are still having these dedicated plants and the dedicated transmission lines mm. to the production uh, plants. Now this may work well for the first few, but if you want to set up a general system, unless you have your grid, uh, unless your grid can handle such huge amounts of renewables, you will not be able to scale up beyond a point no matter how cheap is your RE. Because you have not factored the transmission costs. And I mean, uh, 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 the transmission cost by mean the capital cost of setting up a transmission network. Mm. In India here we sort of take it for granted, but it is not the case in all countries. In fact, most countries. That's why you see this criteria, which if you see Europe, uh, if you see USA, they have this criteria of um, the temporal correlation um, and uh, and the geographic correlation. Now, why is that? Is because in, 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 in Europe, for example, they have the RE, the RE uh, sources are in the north and the consumption is in the south. And they do, not, they do not have the grid which is large enough or robust enough to take all that renewable energy and transport it to the, south, to the, to the southern parts of Europe. That's why you see they are doing, uh, uh, they are setting up a lot of in-situ plants uh, which cost much, much, much more. But since they're not allowed to transport, they cannot transport RE from north to south. They are constrained by their grid. So is USA, so is Europe, so is Australia. So we believe that they are, they're all improving, obviously, but uh, as of now, we are far ahead in terms of the capacity which we have in terms of the transmission infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So we will have, I believe, a few years, maybe a two or three years head start till those countries catch up. Uh, and till that point, I, I don't think, you may see this as a few projects coming up which can afford to have the, have, the, have the dedicated transmission lines, but the moment you have more of these projects, there will be congestion because you cannot allow, I mean, it is unthinkable that every project will have to get the land and the permission to set up its own transmission lines from generation to the, the production plan. So uh, in, in the medium term, in the three to four year scenario, you would see a uh, scale coming up much, much faster in India as compared to these countries, although these countries do have an advantage in terms of the initial pilot projects which, which can come up faster there, I believe. Right. Um, the next question is on, uh, you spoke a little bit about standards. Yeah. So different countries have come up with their own definitions and standards. Uh, is there any effort on the global level to standardize the definition of green hydrogen, especially in terms of emission or production? We tried that very hard in G20. Nobody is agreeing to it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they all say that we want to be harmonized. By, harmonized by them means aligned to our standards. That is not, not acceptable. So how harmonizing at the consumer level, not at the production level, basically? Yeah, so uh, harmonizing, yeah. So, so, so now, now there are two standards. One is the technical standard, that's safety standards. Right. That is a different issue. That, we can always agree upon that, that's not a problem. I'm talking about the legal standards, how yeah. much emissions yeah. uh, to do are, are allowed, what, what is called green. So that nobody is willing to agree to other countries' demands. They will add, all have their own standards right. for legal standards I'm talking about. Hmm. But technical standards, we always, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it, it's not really a big problem. It, you take, a, especially for high standards, we take up the standard, we test in our, in our country, which okay, we take it up. So that, that's not a problem. Mm. So I don't see any much divergence on the safety aspect mm. of it. They will, I mean, that's handled by BIS and PESO. And uh, they will take it up as per their procedure. In fact, if you, uh, we had, we, MNRI had uh, set up working groups in this regard. I, I didn't mention that. 
in my address. But we in, in last May, we had recommended 94 standards to be adopted on the, on, the, on the priority basis until I think January or February, around 65 of them were already published uh, by BIS, PESO and other authorities. Uh, so we will, and I think few more are on the way. In fact, they have gone beyond what we recommended. If you see, ARI is also working on standards for two wheelers and three wheelers for hydrogen. So they are also publishing those standards. So that, I don't, I don't think there's any, any problem um, in that. You can always harmonize that part. But I'm talking about the legal part, the, the geographical correlation, part. temporal correlation. That part is difficult mm -hmm. to harmonize. Right, okay. Uh, we'll take some questions from the audience now. Uh, we'll start from our left, uh, starting from the first row. Yes, sir, please. Yeah, morning, sir. Uh, Banerjee from Hindustan Petroleum. Uh, but the last uh, Sarah week, uh, what I was seeing there, the CEOs of Exxon Mobil and uh, Aramco, uh, they what they were expressing was green hydrogen is too expensive. Nobody wants to buy, and uh, it is too expensive to replace fossil fuels. They were talking about that, and uh, as per uh, the the CEO there, he was talking about uh, in terms of energy, the current uh, cost of uh, green hydrogen. If you convert into energy form, uh, it comes to uh, $400 per uh, barrel of oil, roughly five times green hydrogen cost right now uh, compared to this. Only two ways it can be made affordable. Uh, what was the suggestion given there? So I would like to have an input on that. What they mentioned is uh, sustainable government support and incentives uh, by way of schemes or PLA schemes, whatever it is. Second, second thing is off-take agreement guaranteed for 10 to 15 years. Then only players will come into this place. Infrastructure will come up. Uh, green origin will be moving. Um, structures will come up. So these two areas are very, very vital as per they, what they suggested. So what are your thoughts on that? So I agree that off-take agreements are a crucial part of any project. Uh, I mean, uh, for bankability. As far as India is concerned, uh, the domestic demand we have already given, as I said, the schemes of 2A, 2B site program, they do deal with the refineries and the fertilizer part of it. We'll be, we'll be giving incentives to producers to give, to make ammonia and hydrogen for the refineries and fertilizer industry. So that, the you may now always debate that, okay, this amount, I mean, the, um, the you may always have a, a view that the amount is less. They may also have a view that the quantum is less uh, but that I believe, as, as was discussed, it, 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 it will not be a, a linear curve, it will be an exponential curve. Um, nobody in the world has built hydrogen plants of this scale today, green hydrogen plants. I mean, nobody. There's not a single plant in the world in which has uh, lakhs of tons per annum capacity. So everybody, nobody will also take up these plants in one phase, always do in phase wise. And I believe by that time, the market will come up either domestically or uh, in uh, uh, for export. Uh, especially if you see countries in Europe, they have their mandates for use of green hydrogen. X percentage should be green. And Europe cannot afford to make everything in Europe because it will be too expensive uh, for them. So they will have an import quota, for example. They have an import quota. They, they cannot, beyond that, it is not economical to produce in Europe. So they have to export, uh, import from other countries. And India is a very st <coughs> strong player to support. So as a government, we do not distinguish from export to domestic consumption. As long as the demand is there, uh, uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are happy to uh, come up with incentive programs. And, and I, I, see, I mean, many inventions, many industries grow in a very creeping manner. You know, they creep along and, for example, there is a project by Hygienco for steel industry already commissioned. Many industries, there is a project for, uh, uh, of, uh, I think JSW, if I'm not mistaken, also they're on track to commission it uh, uh, of making green steel. So you will have this creeping progress from all sides, and suddenly you, uh, you realize that you have come much uh, uh, very, very far from where you started. So the government will do its part, but obviously uh, government of India cannot match the scale of incentives given by IRA or EU. That's not possible. We cannot have billions of dollars of subsidies being given. In fact, if you see the recent news, China has challenged the IRA in the WTO, and we have had our experience with such schemes when we went to WTO and uh, we lost certain um, legal disputes. 
so that which create a, a, a uncertainty in the investors minds so we have designed our programs to not sort of uh, come in clash with international trade rules that was also a factor so our incentives are also tapering down with every year at their fixed period and of the agreements are concerned people are already working and uh, india has not given mandates yet but many other countries have and they are willing to procure a look towards india as it's a very uh, as a very reliable partner for supply so i believe of take may not may come from export may come from domestic we we'll have to wait and watch right uh, we'll take one more question from the middle column please uh, with the fourth row please you mentioned about two costs uh, obviously the capex cost of producing hydrogen and the cost of uh, setting up the infrastructure to transmit hydrogen those are two big components generally speaking in terms of the capex investments what is the ratio of these two in terms of uh, the impact that they have on the end hydrogen cost and is it significantly different in some parts of the world uh, it would be based on what you said uh, in different countries so is there any idea on how that is i would not i mean i'm not an expert in the power sector so i would not have an analysis of the transmission cost but generally if you see uh, if you take the uh, uh, interest rate transmission charges they would probably give you a good picture of what is the per unit cost like and it's quite expensive it's around i think i think 2 3 rupees i'm not i'm not sure please check up the ists but india has given ists waiver for rd projects for hydrogen so it will not translate to those so if you see the uh, rd tariffs in india uh, even for a uh, highest uf like 70 75% are around 4 rupees uh, per per unit if you go for vanilla solar it will be around 2.5 for wind around 3.2 3.3 depending upon uh, the scale so that is one of the cheapest in the world and they may further reduce in in the coming years so uh, currently you will get rtc power rtc means around 70 70% uf for around 4 rupees which is one of the cheapest in the world and since there is no tra- charges for transmission you will get that as it is there is no addition to that cost for green hydrogen sector obviously there obviously there there is nothing free somebody pays for it but it will not be the hydrogen producer who will pay for it right uh, any other questions in the middle row uh, okay there are a lot of raised hands so maybe we can come to you later we can go to ma'am first uh, please go to ma'am Uh, I am Ayushi Pandey from Power Grid Corporation. Just adding up to Sir, I want to ask whether there are any international collaborations at place right now for the export of hydrogen. Secondly, are there any price targets set for green hydrogen, and by what time for our country? So one first question and answer: There are, we are so in government will not. Um, how do I say? We can only encourage up to a point. We can have agreements, but. Uh, governments no government no no to democratic governments cannot can force the industries to buy from any other specific country you can create atmosphere where they are encouraged to buy so for example i spoke about article 66.2 agreements so we can talk with various countries for that agreement but obviously that agreement does not mandate any anything it's just a mechanism for transfer of credits to the to that country and inflow of either investment or technology or other such things from that country to india and then the credits will go the jcn credits will go from india to that country the the the, the itmos as they are called will go from india to that other country so we can create atmosphere but we government will never mandate uh, that you have to buy from this country to that country <coughs> they have to buy from the cheapest stores wherever they get it from the second question was what uh, regarding uh, targets yeah. no there are no targets in terms of number if we don't have a, like a us program 111s there's no such program at least not officially we hope to go as low as possible but obviously there are no set targets right uh, we'll take the question from uh, the one there yeah yeah sir uh, prasanna from thermofusion scientific <coughs> sir your job is really challenging uh, why because you're trying to get in a new technology and india is a country with lot of reserves of black gold that is coal and coal india limited i think is the largest employer about 6th uh, or 7th largest employer in the country so how do you see this balance there would be a tug of war between you and the 
mining industry uh, and the, the, the energy sector of the government. So, no, how will it pan out, sir? There's no talk of war. Okay. Every ministry has a target set by the central cabinet. So, we have functional government. Why would there be talk of war? In fact, coal India is getting into renewable power now. Uh, there's a question in the left column. Yeah, uh, can you please come to the second row? We'll come to you, sir, and then we'll come to you, ma'am. Sir, just your thought process that when you design the PLI, especially for the electrolyzers, and if I compare that to the PLI for the solar module, the polysilicon, uh, where the thought process was that the big is good because that's where the costs really go down, and that model has clearly worked. While uh, when we saw the PLI for electrolyzers, it wasn't really of the scale you would expect, which is like a globally competitive gigawatt scale electrolyzer facility. Mm -hmm. And we try to spread ourselves maybe to thin. So what is the broad thought process, sir? And is this just a part one? And as we did in case of solar PLI also, that we jacked up you know, in the phase two significantly and kind of went in for a global scale capacity. Because I really believe that India has a real chance of a, like China plus uh, a quality at maybe Europe minus pricing and can become a hub irrespective of whether green hydrogen happens or not, but for electrolyzer on the strength of the engineering industry <coughs> of India. So is this your thought process, sir, or, or how do you see it? So not really asking what will happen post the election, so see, but we, just the we, thought process. No, so we have got, we have got a limited, number of, limited amount of budget in which we can support limited number. Now if you say one gigawatt, uh, I think we have only two or three players in the country uh, to access the incentives. That, that is not the situation which we are looking for. So the, now it's always difficult if it is too thin or not too thin because, see, no company builds a business based on the incentives alone. Incentives is just a, yeah. a, a bonus, so to say, you know, to increase their profitability in the first few years by a few percentage points. So no country and... Uh, uh, a business based on incentives will never survive. <coughs> it will shut down after the incentives are shut down. So our incentives are never, never intended to uh, have a, I mean the, we don't want that our uh, uh, companies are addicted to incentives for setting up their business. They only set up business if they have a business case without incentives. Right. Our incentives give them an initial push which they require Clearly. and lead at that. So whether we do it for 300 megawatts which we've done or 500, or 700 or 1 gigawatt. It would not have made much difference in companies' plans. It's just that here, uh, you see, many companies feel that they have a chance to compete. And that's, that's why they innovate. So if you give less incentives, you get more innovation. I mean, so our, our target was not to have too small and too large. It was somewhere in the middle. Now you can always debate on whether 300 megawatt is optimal or no. There is no way for anyone to tell whether it's optimal or no. There right. is no metric developed for that anywhere in the world. Right. So, but this is a general feeling of the industry. It's a ballpark figure. Um, and that, that's how it was. The end of is not, we didn't, we didn't pull out of a hat. We talked to the industry, obviously, and there was a compromise based upon their reason and needs and what we would want to, as India's needs, we want to have more players and we want to have more incentives. It was a compromise. You know, the truth lies in the middle somewhere as always. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll take one last question and uh, then we'll close the session. Yeah, hi, sir. Uh, I'm Alvika Desai from Renew. So I actually had two questions. Uh, one was that uh, governments all over, there are a couple, like, there are uh, ample of decarbonization targets happening, right? But there is, there is no monetary penalty as such on offtake. So are there any discussions happening at the government level that how these targets can be achieved? Monetary on which offtake? Sorry? Monetary penalties on offtake. By India or others, you're saying? Others. So, uh, I, I, I'm not well aware of their legal structure on which... Uh, but see, I mean, there is currently no penalty. Uh, so, for example, I'll talk know about India. I mean, I don't know about other countries, but we have the Energy Conservation Act, which allows BWE to impose such mandates. And I believe there were... I believe when the time comes, they will impose these, these mandates. So that's why, for example, you have the, we have the carbon market, right? It's the CCTS scheme. Now that scheme will never work if you, there are no penalties. So, but that is the area of BWE, I believe, which will answer, uh, give a proper answer to that because they are the in charge of the agency of enforcing 
the Energy Conservation Act. So I think uh, a legal answer, if you're looking for, uh, BWE is the place to actually get your answers properly. Right, and uh, one last question was also on that uh, we realize, for example, in APAC market, that uh, they have a cutoff when it comes to what they classify as green in terms of their carbon intensity, which means that blending is a possible solution. So, uh, is, are there any mechanisms or methodologies being decided that how will the accounting come into picture? Yeah, yeah. so I just mentioned that, that the certification part is still left and we are working on that with the industry and uh, as I said, because I cannot comment more on this at this point of time, uh, but you will see progress on it uh, shortly. Thank right. you. Thank you. On that note, we close the session. A big hand for Dr. Chafiko, please.